Writing in 1930 in The Painter's Craft, one of New York's most established art critics, Royal Cortizo, offered readers a glowing assessment of George Bellow's life and art. Cortizo's praised the artist's Americanism, noting Bellow's ability to create canvases that infused what he saw with, quote, all the American traits of breadth, simplicity, sincerity, and blunt truth, which Bellows drew from the soil, close quote. To make the case that truly American paintings were more than mere recordings of native life, he contrasted the lowly reproduction of facts with the higher creation of truths. As the critic opined, quote, if subject as subject were alone to be considered, then the wharf rats and pugilists and polo players of George Bellows might be no nearer to canonization than the boot blacks and newsboys of the late J.G. Brown. For Cortizos, what separated Bellows from Brown was neither subject matter nor style alone, but the former's facility for transforming the people and objects of contemporary American life into compositions that communicated America's blunt truths. From our modern vantage, there's nothing surprising about an early 20th century critic pointing to the higher truths contained in Bellow's work. Marianne Dozema and Rebecca Zurier have each analyzed the powerful investment of early century critics and audiences in the truth value of Bellow's art. What is noteworthy, however, is Cortizos' expressed belief that Brown's sentimental canvases of boot blacks and newsboys provided factual records of American life, even as they failed to express higher truths. Looked at this way, the critic's assessment raises the intriguing question of which facts evident in Bellows, excuse me, which facts evident in Brown's canvases needed to be transcended to create paintings that expressed Bellows' truths. Perhaps it was race. As distinctive as their canvases and reputations appear to us today, the artists shared a number of narrative interests. Each created scenes of the leisure class at play and landscapes that recorded American rural life but in each case, their fame rested on depictions of working class New York. But whereas brown scenes of newsboys, boot blacks, street vendors, and waifs frequently depicted interracial contact, Bellow's paintings of street kids, beaches, and urban tenements virtually always confined themselves to figures who were white. Brown's paintings took for granted the existence of non-whites in New York City, and moreover, of black-white relations in ways distinct from Bellow's so-called truthful artworks. We may argue over the political work that the interracial scenes perform in Brown's genre paintings, and to be clear, I make no claims for their progressive politics. Brown's paintings undoubtedly appealed to European-American audiences for the ways in which they confirmed dominant racial hierarchies. My point is simply that the visual effacement of interracial contact may have been part of the price that needed to be paid to create so-called national paintings for a European-American elite. I make this claim in light of the considerable interracial and interethnic contacts, contacts that were then a daily feature of Bellow's life in New York City. In depicting the truth of early 20th century New York, Bellows had to work hard at excluding people of color from his canvases. Consider that when Bellows arrived in New York City in 1904, 37% of the city's residents were foreign born, a figure that would peak at just over 40% by the 1910 census. And that between 1900 and 1920, the city's black population would more than double as African Americans migrated from the South and immigrated from the Caribbean. In 1920, the Omen Map Company published its map of the borough of Manhattan and part of the Bronx showing location and extent of racial colonies. You can see this huge map here, which won't be legible. I'm going to rotate it north-south and show you a detail that's basically from the Battery in the south to the southern end of Central Park. The map color-coded Manhattan's city blocks, indicating concentrations of European ethnic minorities, Negroes, and Chinese, and living uncolored the neighborhoods it deemed, quote, mixed. In the lexicon of the map makers, mixed was a euphemism for neighborhoods populated primarily with European Americans from Western Europe. Bellow's first residence upon his arrival in New York in 1904 was in the dormitory of the original West Side YMCA at 318 West 57th Street, which was then located in a solidly white area of Manhattan. 
It was near the New York School of Art at West 57th Street and 6th Avenue, where he studied under Robert Henry. But we know from Beller's biographer and the visual record of his artworks that the painter ranged widely throughout New York City, spending time in such ethnic and racial enclaves as San Juan Hill, which was black, Hell's Kitchen, which was Irish and black, and the Lower East Side, which was Jewish and Italian. I went a little crazy with the add-ons, but I was having fun. When he purchased his home in 1910 at 146 West 19th Street, Bellows moved into a house just south of Gramercy Park in a neighborhood with a significant racial and ethnic mix. According to the 1910 census, the blocks immediately surrounding his home were home to white, but also black, mulatto, Chinese, and Japanese residents. From the census records, it's clear that there were five blacks then living on Bellows' own block. Just one block to the east along 19th Street, one encountered one of the largest concentrations of Polish and Russian Jewish immigrants in the United States, marked on the map in eye-catching red. To the north and south of his home were additional immigrant concentrations of Scandinavians, Irish, and Italians. But Bellows' contact with non-whites was even more intimate. According to the 1915 New York State Census enumeration of the inhabitants of Bellows Block, George, his wife, and two young daughters shared their home with a 19-year-old black woman from Jamaica, Hilda May Anglin, whose occupation was listed as domestic servant. Taking as my point of entry the visual record Bellows left us, I wish to account for the underrepresentation of blacks in the artist's work and to make a case for the interests served by the particular formulation of white-black relations when they do make an appearance in his artworks. To be sure, the vast majority of Bellows' output, output records the physiognomies, pastimes, and working lives of whites. Audiences today understand that paintings that depict whites are as imbued with racial values as those that, those that portray people of color. But for the artist and his European-American contemporaries, Paintings of white people would have, been, would have appeared to have self-evidently transcended race. In a number of paintings, drawings, and lithographs, Bellows depicted white ethnic types, primarily European immigrants and their children. Differences in language, custom, and of course economic means helped relegate such ethnic groups to lower stations on the hierarchy of whiteness. But such differences did not prevent European immigrants from enjoying federally protected benefits of white citizenship. Bellows' illustrations of European immigrants may have presented his wealthy clients with a symbolic other against which to me measure their self-worth, but the paintings were simultaneously an urban gloss on the pastoral tradition, which allowed wealthy patrons to imagine the supposedly carefree and simpler lives of the urban poor. As Marianne Dozema has explained with regard to Bellow's paintings of street urchins, their positive reception was linked in part to their presentation of colorful, unthreatening figures. Because his paintings of immigrants posed no challenge to moneyed whites, the artworks enjoyed a certain fluidity of meaning. They made it possible for those oblivious to calls for urban reform to see in the canvases the exotic and carefree lives of simpler people and they allowed more socially conscious viewers to read the artworks through reformist newspaper and literary tracts that made the case for improving the conditions of people of color, excuse me, made the, made the case for improving the conditions of groups capable of assimilating. We must bear in mind that it was more than the depicted narratives that made the canvases safe for wealthy white viewers in the early 20th century. The depictions were ultimately non-threatening because the depicted figures were understood to be removed from the artist and his patrons by a generation or two of uplift, rather than by the immutable divide of race. Of the more than 400 paintings and 200 drawings and lithographs Bellows created, non-whites appear in just over a dozen artworks. It's noteworthy that they are rare, appear largely in lithographs and drawings, which were then seen as lower art forms in the reigning hierarchy of the arts, and that in every case, the non-white figures were black. While the sample size is modest, Bellow's depictions of blacks may be grouped into one of three narrative categories. Some are depicted in all black worlds where whites do not appear. 
Examples include the drawing known today as the Can Battle, San Juan Hill from 1907, originally titled San Juan Hill, Niggers Having a Tin Can Battle. The San Juan Hill neighborhood of Manhattan was located on the west side, north and west of the studio apartment Bellows rented at 1947 Broadway in 1907. In the first decades of the century, before the majority of the city's black residents migrated north to Harlem, this impoverished neighborhood was home to the largest concentration of African Americans in Manhattan. In other artworks, blacks appear as mere incidental elements of background interest. Here is the lithograph 16 East Gay Street, which conjures up the artist's Victorian childhood in Columbus. A group of black youths on the left makes its way along the sidewalk through a prosperous white neighborhood of spacious homes and wide front porches. In the lithograph, the black figures assume a role that was refined in hundreds of 19th century artworks, wherein a non-white figure or two is included on the margins to reinforce the whiteness of the main actors. Here are the two children who labor over the tricycle. But in the majority of Bellow's artworks that include non-whites, they are illustrated in conflict with whites. The trope of black-white conflict is illustrated most famously in depictions of boxing matches, which appeared in drawings, lithographs, and a painting, including the white hope, the savior of his race, and both members of this club. And it is also evident in the artist's drawing in lithograph of a lynching, the law is too slow. It may strike some listeners as cavalier to link boxing and lynching scenes together under the banner of interracial conflict when the real world stakes of sporting events and extrajudicial killings are so disparate. A prize fight, no matter how racially charged, cannot compare to the mob's torture and murder of a man. But my point in drawing the works together is not merely to make superficial claims for a shared narrative theme. I want to argue first that the conflicts depicted shed meaningful light on the challenges facing artists in the early 20th century for creating so-called truthful American artworks, and second, that the boxing and lynching artworks served remarkably similar symbolic functions for period whites. As is famously and always briefly recalled, both members of this club was originally titled A Nigger and a White Man. For reasons unknown to us today, Bellows changed the title to its current one within months of the painting's completion. The present title wryly references the fact that social customs in the North ensured that non-whites and whites did not then belong to the same clubs. In order to skirt laws barring professional prize fights, promoters would enroll fighters and their spectators as members of sham athletic clubs. Thus, the fights could proceed under the fiction of taking place in private clubs amongst members. Such membership gave prize fights enough cover to be openly fought even as they presented the unintended appearance of having joined whites and blacks together on equal terms. While it is tempting to read the title as a liberal reformer's efforts to highlight this inconsistency, there is little evidence to suggest that this was the painter's aim. Despite Bellow's left-of-center views on freedom of expression, his racial views show every indication of having been mainstream. His notebooks and correspondence document that he used the terms nigger and jap, and the recollections of his daughter Jean suggest that he was comfortable dressing in blackface. Bellow's biographer, who worked with the full cooperation of the painter's widow and created an otherwise hagiographic account of Bellow's life, stated flatly that the title was derisive and placed it in the context of the early 20th century popularity of minstrel shows. Two decades later, Marianne Dozema set the painting in a broader historical context seeing it as an expression of the white hysteria that swept the country after the black fighter Jack Johnson won the heavyweight title from the white defending champion in late December of 1908. As Dozema and subsequent scholars have documented, white America's perception of a loss that defied natural law momentarily destabilized notions of white superiority. When a subsequent title fight between Johnson and a retired, undefeated white champion resulted once more in a black victory, whites rioted against and lynched blacks across the United States in an ugly spasm of violence aimed at restoring the symbolic order. Both members of this club is a painting deeply enmeshed in racial politics, 
which may explain why it remained unsold until 1944, two decades after the artist's death as a work that delved too overtly into the racial facts of its era. It was incapable of meeting potential buyers' expectations of a transcendent American artwork. The Law's Too Slow pictures a conflict with much higher stakes. The Century Magazine commissioned the lithograph from Bellows for a short story by Mary Johnston on lynching that was published in May of 1923. It is said that Bellows was deeply affected by a newspaper report of a lynching in Wilmington, Delaware, that ran in his hometown newspaper when he was a boy, and that the memory animated his approach to the commission for the century. Contemporaries noted that the lithograph appeared to comment on rather than record interracial conflict. His biographer called it a protest, and his widow claimed that in it he eschewed his usual position of attached observer and, quote, instead reflected his, di his direct emotional reaction." Close quote. The fictional story that accompanied the lithograph recounted the lynching of a black man arrested for the rape and murder of a white woman in the South and the unforeseen consequences that befell the whites who led the lynching party. During a decade when the KKK had reached the height of its power in the US with a membership estimated at several million, the short story and its illustration drew attention to the physical horror of lynching for blacks and its psychic cost to whites. Its commission may have been inspired by the much debated failure of the dire anti-lynching bill, which sought to make it a federal crime for a mob of three or more people to engage in extrajudicial killing. After the bill's passage in the House of Representatives in January 1922, it was filibustered by Southern Democrats in the Senate and died in December of that year, the same month, month in which Bellows received his commission. Accounts of the artwork invariably conclude by commenting on its progressive social work. They frequently note that Walter White, executive secretary of the NAACP, requested permission from Bellows' widow to use the laws too slow as the frontispiece for his anti-lynching track, Rope and Faggot, in 1929 and his exhibition and catalog, An Art Commentary on Lynching, in 1935. White reproduced Bellow's lithograph because he perceived its potential to advance the anti-lynching cause. He worked furiously as leader of the NAACP during the 1920s and 30s to publicize lynchings and build support among the public and politicians for federal anti-lynching legislation. Notwithstanding White's faith in the progressive potential of the laws too slow, the lithograph performed complex racial work. The scene is obviously gruesome. It features a naked black man chained to a tree as a fire is stoked at his feet, and judging from his absence of genitals and the apparent flow of blood down his leg, it illustrates a figure who's been castrated by the mob. This was not a narrative detail contained in the short story, but one that Bellows likely drew from the period's most graphic news media accounts of anti-black violence. The art historian Helen Langa notes that in the early 20th century, white artists rarely addressed lynching in their art. According to Langa, those who did, however, consistently depicted explicit scenes of lynch violence and its terrifying outcomes. While white artists could have tackled the issue from any number of angles, choosing, for instance, to represent black mobilization against anti-black violence, including often massive protest rallies, they chose to raise the issue by reinscribing blacks as victims. Such artworks had the collateral result of normalizing the violence and victimhood of blacks, which was the very issue that organizations such as the NAACP sought to address. It could not have been easy for black audiences to view such artworks, even if they ultimately believed that their circulation brought needed publicity to an issue that received scant attention on the national stage. For white viewers, the challenges of viewing were different. Whites surely found graphic depictions of violence unsettling, but I want to suggest that the explicit lithographs of lynching were ultimately easier for them to view than other depictions of racial injustice. Because the actions of the white mob were so aberrant, so indefensible, lynching, lynching scenes allowed most whites to distance themselves from the beliefs and actions of the depicted killers. 
By illustrating one of the more extreme forms of anti-black racism, white artists decreased the likelihood of audiences being compelled to identify with the killers. Without such identification, viewers could be troubled by generic scenes of violence without having to consider their personal complicity in a racial system that both made such violence possible and more broadly disadvantaged blacks in every aspect of American life. Consider that the short story, Nemesis, for which Bellows created his illustration, argued against the practice of lynching, not against the racist treatment of blacks by the legal system. The opening lines of the short story make plain the lack of evidence implicating Jim Lizard, the black man lynched in the narrative. As the narrator explains, quote, they said a black man had done the crime. Perhaps he had, perhaps he had not, close quote. The only evidence offered against Lizard was the inconclusive testimony of the victim moments before her death. For reasons not explained in the short story, the sheriff sent a posse after Lizard as soon as he learned of the crime. Once captured, Lizard is brought before the dying woman whose eyes, we are told, were glazing over, and who explains to the sheriff that she, quote, can't see, close quote. Asked to identify her attacker by his voice alone, she replies, quote, I reckon that's his voice, close quote. The narrator explains, it's likely enough that she hardly knew what was wanted. It's hard to tell. Perhaps it was an identification, close quote. Despite the paucity of evidence against Lizard, the narrator states blandly, quote, there is no doubt at all that the law would have hanged Jim Lizard had it been given the chance, close quote. Modern readers are left to assume that the flimsy case against Lizard is designed to set the stage for the story's broad attack on the treatment of blacks in the South, but this is not the case. The moral of the short story hinges on the distinctions between legal and extra-legal killings, not between justice and injustice. The men who lynch Lizard are haunted by the crime and suffer various bad ends, while the sheriff and his posse, who initiated the hunt for a black scapegoat, suffer no ill consequences. Because they ostensibly worked within the law, the men who arrested Lizard on flimsy evidence are treated as blameless. What separates guilty from innocent whites is not their desire to see Lizard die, but rather their inability to let the law take its racist course. Both members of this club and the Law's Too Slow appear at first blush to represent distinctly different racial politics, and yet they each used interracial conflict as a vehicle for managing white racial anxiety. More obviously, both members telegraphed the period concern of whites over an ascendant black boxer, and with what the rise of a non-white champion said about the instability of racial hierarchies. While the law's too slow was surely motivated by outrage over lynching, its graphic brutality provided an outlet for, out, for outrage that mimics the preferred white formula for depicting racial violence, and in so doing, compromised the artwork's utility as a catalyst for reform. In depicting a scene of spectacular violence against blacks, the lithograph championed an ostensibly progressive cause with a visual formula that diminished the likelihood of northern whites taking responsibility for the racial inequalities of the US. Much as the short story demarcated an artificial divide between white actors that ignored their shared investment in a racial value system that was patently unfair to blacks, so Bellows lithographed allowed white viewers to overlook the racial links between themselves and the depicted murderers. The lithograph was ultimately a vehicle for white emotion, not introspection. Walter White and the NAACP worked hard to make lynching a national scandal in an effort to prod a reluctant Congress and Presidents Hoover and Roosevelt to champion anti-lynching legislation. His use of Bellow's print in his struggle was surely a double-edged sword. While the laws too slow brought attention to the issue, its combined focus on graphic violence and on the action of Southerners mitigated against the emergence of lynching as a national issue. The lithograph's division of white actors from viewers helped cement the scene as one of local color, admittedly of local color gone horribly wrong. Added to these challenges was the problem posed in getting European Americans to read an artwork depicting interracial conflict, particularly one that was self-evidently on the side of blacks, as capturing a national truth. As the reception of Bellow's works during these decades strongly suggests, 
national artworks confine themselves to scenes that self-evidently advance the interests of whites. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Um, in the discussion upstairs yesterday, the possibility was raised, which I think is fascinating, um, that Emma, I guess it's clear that Emma changed some of the titles, right, from, in the record book. Yeah, and so. Sure, she did it, but it's not clear whether George had changed it and she was just reflecting mm -hmm. that or she changed it. Is, is the title then also changed on this painting in the record book? That is it recorded? The, the title of this is changed, and the in the record it, book. I, in the record book, mm -hmm. but I believe that it's by Bellow's hand. In his hand. It happened, as Morgan explains, and uh, who's the main biographer of mm -hmm. Bellow's, and there's no explanation that it was done within a couple of months of the painting's completion. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for for this talk and the previous one too. It it kind of has opened up some interesting thoughts in my mind, and the f one thing that, that popped up is that it seems that some of Bellow's work was almost journalistic. I, I, is that something that anybody has put any thought into? I mean, you know, he, he's reporting things, he's trying to convince people of things. He, he doesn't seem to have sometimes even a, an idea of, you know, that he likes it or doesn't like it. Is that true? I'm not the world's bellows expert, but I can tell you that the, a lot of the Ashcan painters had either worked in journalism or, or to some degree in, in, in advertising. Bellows was an illustrator, and he thought he was going to continue to be an illustrator earlier in his career, so he was working out of that kind of reporting venue. A lot of people have written about the connections of journalism to early 20th century art, but I don't know specifically, and perhaps there are other people in the audience who can comment more directly on whether Bellows saw himself as a reporter. So un unlike Leo, I'm not skirting the question. I'm telling you I don't know. <laughs> what do you make of him living in the mixed neighborhoods? Leaving. Oh, what do you make of him living in the mixed neighborhoods in New York? and the contact that he had with blacks. I mean, um, when, when you started the talk, I was sort of thinking that you were gonna make an argument that, you know, he, he was attempting to, you know, produce some images that were reformist, you know, that race was maybe at the center of some of his political work. But I think you're not making that argument. Um, but what, so what do you make of where he, why did you tell us where he lived? Do you think that's important? And his contact with, with blacks and immigrants? Yeah, it wasn't just that I was having fun with my map, but <laughs> I know, I, it's a nice map. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes, I, when I began this, Melissa expressly invited some scholars to participate in this symposium who were Bellows experts and some who had worked on other things and thought could bring a different perspective to bear. And I was decidedly in that other group. So I had a general familiarity with Bellow's paintings, and I used him in my undergraduate teaching, but I hadn't spent a lot of time thinking about it. But as I began to look at the paintings, I realized that there was an absence of kind of black presence. And I became interested, well, it certainly didn't reflect the population of New York during this period. So I thought, let's trace where Bellow's lived. Let's trace where Bellow's worked. Let's see where he went to do his sketches and his paintings. Because I thought that it highlighted the contrast of what must have been the day-to-day -day interactions he had with a whole range of different ethnic white types and also people of color as we now define them throughout New York City, and then how interesting that they drop out of the final canvases. So I began with that 1930s art critic talking about the Americanism of his works, and I was struck in, in Randy's paper yesterday that many of those quotes I could have used as well that talked about Bellows as this uniquely truthful, virile, but also American painter and trying to make the case that for many critics, and I think for many buyers during the period, that to create American paintings was essentially to create paintings that needed to efface race on some level, to leave that out of the equation. So I'm not saying that Bellows is a bad guy by any stroke of the mm -hmm. imagination. I think he was sort of 
his racial views were, were fairly mainstream, maybe, maybe slightly progressive for its day. I don't, all I mean to say about him is he was simply of his period, but I think it's interesting for us not to sort of whitewash that feature of him. I very much understand why the prints, the lithographs, don't carry titles in museums today that reflect those original titles with the offensive labels, because you know, kids going to museums shouldn't have to confront it. But I do think that there's an absence in the scholarly literature, too, about these issues. And I think that is unfortunate. And that's a way in which things get whitewashed, not to the advantage of history. And so we need to, we need to focus on why there are these absences and whose interests those absences serve. Sympathy question. I'm not sure that this is going to emerge into a question, but I'm, I'm just going to state some thoughts and see. Hopefully, it'll take me somewhere. So your contrast with John George Brown at the start and um, asking us to think about facts versus truth is making me th try to think about um, aesthetics in the early 20th century and Bellows is working and how a kind of, oh, I don't know. if you might think about the homogenizing of figures in his art, the whitewashing, to borrow a term you're using, um, to try to think about that in connection with aesthetic discourse at the time, and oh, some idea about aesthetic purity, or if you would want to link those kinds of ideas, paying attention to Bellows' style and how different that obviously is from someone like Brown, uh, maybe that's what's making me think of this, if there's a way to think about aesthetic discourse, Bellos's style, and the kind of whitewashing in terms of iconography and the sorts of characters we find featured, if you'd want to say anything about that. And or, if some of the, the technique he uses in something like 42 Kids, where you have this, you know, nothing is really um, delineated with the kind of precision that we find in brown. You have this mashing together of paint strokes, and therefore, I would say a kind of complication of identity, potentially, there of saying, you know, these figures are all white, and we can all see this clearly. Um, so I guess that's sort of in the back of my mind as I'm asking this question about aesthetics in this period, mm -hmm. what you might say to that. You know, aesthetics, aesthetics isn't my thing either, in addition to Bellows. But I will, I will say that I think that part of what made Brown potentially old-fashioned and not as American in this period is certainly that his aesthetics were retrograde, that this was, this was a kind of 19th century realism that had been slightly updated. Bellows, I think, in consciously trying to craft American paintings that, to some extent, straddled the divide between European and American avant-garde stylistic conceptions was pushing, you know, he was, as I said to somebody yesterday, he was, he was a moderate rebel. He's the kind of rebel we like who isn't pushing too fast, too far, that makes us uncomfortable. And so I think he's, he's pushing slightly on stylistic, and then I think at the same time, as part of his projects to keep his painting safe, he needs to he needs to leave out these racial things that makes Brown's work look as if it's, I think, mired in, in a 19th century tradition. You know, blacks appeared much more frequently, I would hazard a guess, in the late 19th century in American painting than they did in the early 20th century, at least at the hands of white painters. So I think this was, it, it might be a way in which this was part of the project. Yes. So Martin, what does a uh, professor of visual culture use as his, as his uh, information that he passes on? The, so in the classroom, you mean? Or it's, our department tries to teach in a way that's become more popular in art history departments and in visual culture departments in the last couple of decades, which is not to confine ourselves just to the high art products. So, we're not looking merely at sculptures and oil paintings produced by white men, but we're trying to look also at advertisements and needlepoint and quilts and architecture produced by white men, but also produced by people who traditionally don't get a voice in American culture or who don't get, uh, don't get monographs written about them. So it's an attempt to look high and low, to broaden out our conception of what can count as evidence 
and to bring other people's voices into the conversation. So it's, it's not art traditionally defined, it's, it's a little broader than that. Thanks. Uh, I was kind of follow up on that. I really liked your reading of the lithograph on the left and how this helps sort of white viewers distance themselves from these sort of acts, but also other forms of racism. So my question is, what about depictions of lynchings by black artists, like Hale Woodruff, Charles Alston, Aaron Douglas, that are depicting scenes of lynchings at the same time? Mm -hmm. How do those paintings contrast with scenes by white artists? Lynching imagery, both in photography and in sculpture and prints, has received a lot more attention in the last couple of decades. And there's some scholars who want to make the argument that black artists have a different take because. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Kehinde Wiley, um, who works out of New York, but came to Columbus and did a, a marvelous project. And we have some great pictures here. I'm thinking there's still some of them are on display. Um, if you get a chance, uh, I think you'd really enjoy. He, he uh, depicts some very strong African Americans and is excellent art. Th thank you. I, I, there is one hanging that I saw yesterday, and I, I, I do enjoy the work. Thank you. I keep thinking on it because I'm not quite sure where to go, but maybe it's apropos to thinking a little more about the print, um, uh, the East Gay Street, which um, I, don't, I think we talked earlier or somewhere that that address doesn't actually exist. It never existed. Um, and it was done when Bellows came back um, to visit his dying mother. And so it's, you know, we sort of talk about it as a nostalgic image about his neighborhood. And, um, but when, now after having watched that Columbus um, documentary and the changes in the neighborhood where he grew up, but I don't know when those happen, it makes me rethink think possibly that the, the, um, the racial dynamic in that print, uh, given the possible changes maybe before or after, or the changes as Bellows remembered that neighborhood, that that gets, um, I don't know, that gets resident in the, in the racial dynamic, dynamics in that print. And I don't know if it does or not, I don't know enough information about it, but just the juxtaposition of that documentary and your talk brings that up. First of all, your um, talk and Leo's talk was terrific, so thank you very much. Uh, years ago, I was Rebecca Zurier's student when she was no. a visiting professor at uh, the institution where I earned my PhD. And we talked a lot about Bellows', Bellows depiction of class. And I remember at the time being very struck by uh, Rebecca's sort of making a parallel between caricature, comics, uh, animal-like features, and his depictions of the lower classes. And I see a kind of parallel between the work you do. Of course, uh, Rebecca was sort of an early pioneer of visual culture, where she was looking outside of traditional art historical sources, and you know, like as Leo did, looking on government websites for patents and baseball cards and, and that sort of thing. So I wondered if um, it seems like class is playing into this as well um, with a real distrust of the lower class um, and that class and race are so closely imbricated. Obviously, you're talking about the, the lynched body, but there seems to be a kind of othering going on both in terms of class and race. I, I, I don't think know if you wanted to address that. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, and I, and I agree. But I think one of the ways in which we sometimes get led astray is that if we're focusing on the formal elements, there are a lot of white ethnic types who seem to be, for lack of a better word, caricatured in Bellow's art to the same degree that the African American figures are. But I think it's essential that we keep within our sight the fact that these white ethnic types in a generation or two are going to be white, and they're going to have you know, all the privileges. The caricatured blacks in a generation or two are going to be another generation or two of caricatured blacks. And so in formal terms, while you can see a kind of parallel, and while I absolutely agree, 
that they serve a kind of similar need of othering. The kind of degree of othering is different, and I think, I think it's the world of difference that one group has the potential to basically be bellows in a generation or two, and one group is hopelessly mired in their genetics. And that, I think, is really important that we pay attention to. Hello. Um, I'm curious about this, the mention of uh, Bellows being comfortable in blackface. Um, I came across a, a photograph of him when he was on Monhegan Island, and he was uh, supposedly playing the ringmaster, and it seemed awfully obvious to me that he was also in blackface, and you're speaking um, of him being comfortable um, in his time, or, or, sort of, or his sort of notion of race being very common of his time. I'm wondering about, about that aspect. Um, is, is blackface something that we can sort of um, associate with being, well, just sort of a natural thing to be comfortable with? It, it, I didn't hear the end part. Is blackface what? Would, would that be something that we could, uh, I guess, excuse him of as being something of his time? Well, I certainly think blackface was very much of his time, as many of you probably know, it continued up through the 1950s and 60s in, in some parts of the United States. So it's certainly not surprising to see references to people in blackface in the 1900s or 1910s. But I raised the example last to suggest that we needed to be angry at Bellows for having done that, then to suggest that there were ways in which he was comfortable taking on the you know, the attributes of African Americans during the period. There were figures of speech that he used during the period that we don't consider acceptable today. That is a fact, and that fact isn't communicated in a lot of the literature because there's an understandable desire, certainly in his hometown, but also when major retrospectives are being produced, that you don't want to sully the artist that you're, that you're celebrating at the same time. But I don't see it as so much of a sullying because I know that I have my blind spots that are going to be apparent, if, if not to my students now, then certainly in 10 or 20 years are, are going to come out. It doesn't mean that I was a terrible professor in, in 2013. It just means I was of my moment of 2013. So I'm just trying to put Bellows back into that, into that moment and to suggest that we need to pay attention to him not as a liberal reformer of the 21st century, but as a kind of moderate liberal of the early part of the 19th century. It's just to return him to his period. And then I think to understand these images in a slightly more complicated way, because too often we're looking at them and trying to understand them through a very contemporary lens, which I think distorts what we decide about are they or are they not progressive, which whether we phrase it in that bold a way is essentially what many of us in classrooms or in our research are ultimately doing, trying to decide, is it good or is it bad? Is it doing work that I agree with or disagree with? All right. Um, thank you, Martin. Thank you. Um, so this time, last time I promised you lunch and it was, didn't quite happen the way I, it was supposed to happen, but this time I have been promised that it will. So <laughs> there are extra lunches, sandwiches, that kind of thing in the little museum shop. Again, we have this room across the hall. We can all sit and talk. There's coffee, sodas, tea, water, whatever else in there for all of us. And uh, we are reconvening at 1.30. So uh, take a little break talk, get food, sit over there, and we'll come back.